Okay. At this point in the series, I will parallel the judgments of the Most High to the judgments of Rome, or what they call Edom, the Caucasoid people whose name is currently on the lease of the earth. At some point in part four, I will discuss the Lake Road situation. As I've stated before, Lucifer, the devil, is on Lake Roll. Okay? Lake Roll is death roll. The lake of fire. Okay, man gets death roll from Lake Roll. Okay, the scriptures say that devil who deceived the nations will be the first. Him and the false prophet will be the first to be cast into the lake of fire. They will be cast alive into the lake of fire. Listen, on the day of judgment, the Most High will reveal his face. In part two, I already established how Apostle Paul fell on his face as a dead man. Okay, mentioned in Revelation chapter one, I believe. And in Revelation 6, 16, they, the merchants of the earth, the kings of the earth, they ask for the mountains to fall on them because they saw the face of the Most High. Okay, Revelation 1, 7, says even those who pierced him will see him in the clouds of heaven. So again, how does the Most High look? That matters a lot as a deterrent to those who might think twice about fearing him. And the so-called white man, at least the majority of them, has not thought twice about it. Just look at his fruits. Look at his judgments. You see, the mark of a satanic apparatus or kingdom is the extermination of children, the degradation of women, and the oppression or incarceration of men. So your judgments for Section 8, for abortion, child support, redlining, your credit system, white privilege, on the day of judgment, the Most High will ask the judges of the earth, hey, what was the purpose of child support in Section 8 and abortion? Why did you do that? <laughs> of course, he knows the answers, and no lying word can be spoken in his presence, according to the scriptures. But he's asking because he knows that their deeds will actually be a witness against him. And in the day of judgment, people are just going to be telling on themselves. They're going to be telling on what was in their heart. The scriptures say the Most High judges, or he discerns what's in the heart. Okay, the thoughts and intent of the heart. James 5 verse 3 says, your gold will testify against you. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 through 20. It says, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. Could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich. Because you say, I repeat, I am rich. So he's talking to a rich church. Okay, they're cathedrals. And they make sure to keep their churches segregated. Okay, they say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. Now, remember, earlier in Revelation, Christ talked about those who are Jews and those who are not, okay? He told them, the real Jews, I know your poverty. So he's speaking to people who are in poverty, saying that those people are rich because they are rich with the word of God. The oracles of God were committed to them, okay? So continuing, he said, I have become wealthy, have need of nothing. Okay, you got to look at the people who fit this description here. Continuing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, 
be zealous and repent. Verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Okay, let's go to Joel chapter 3, verse 3 through 6. Okay, it says, verse 3, They have cast lots for my people, have given a boy as payment for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. Indeed, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coast of Philistia? Will you retaliate against me? But if you retaliate against me, swiftly and speedily I will return your retaliation upon your own head, because you have taken my silver and my gold, this is the most high talking, and have carried into your temples my prized possessions. Also, the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem you have sold to the Greeks, that you may remove them far from their borders. So clearly, you can see the Most High demands payment for what was done to his jewels. And he doesn't demand payment in currency, but blood, the lake of fire. So you cannot allow the matrix to blind you to the tentacles of white supremacy. Sin is incredibly expensive. And I've talked about their evil deeds during the transatlantic slave trade and to this day. Man cannot outlive his sins. The books got to be balanced and reparations are paid back in blood. So thus far in this series, I have already presented how white supremacist theologians have manipulated the scriptures to conceal the sins of their forefathers. I have expressed the true meaning of judgment according to Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 through 3. So let's go there real quick. Okay, going to Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 through 3. It says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Verse 3. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Okay, the measure of judgment we talked about what judgment really means in part two. That measure, measured back to you. Well, what if you judge according to the skin color of a person? We all know that so-called white people are notorious for doing this. Most of them, not all, but most. Okay, the overwhelming majority, especially the ones who yield a lot of power. And all it takes is a majority for those of you who may claim that I'm being vague. But what if I told you the measure of judgment so-called white people use to judge blacks subjects them to the judgment of the law written in Leviticus chapter 13? Remember, in 1 John 4.20, it says, He who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Okay, in this context, Skin color certainly matters because the sinner was identified according to skin color in Leviticus chapter 13 because lepers were not permitted to enter the tabernacle of God. And we know the tabernacle of the Lord after this dispensation is eternal heaven. And if you're not going to eternal heaven, then you're going to the lake of fire. You see how I just connected all of it? That's why these false theologians twisted what leprosy really means. No, leprosy is a plague that came upon humanity through the fallen angel seed. Okay, you got to look at Genesis 1. When God created man in the beginning, he took man from the dust of the earth. Okay, and he said everything he made was good. All right. If man's person is compromised after that, we know that sin has something to do with that. That's why rooted in the word skin, S-K-I-N, is the word sin, S-I-N. 
Okay, and Leviticus 13 gives a detailed explanation of how man's skin pigmentation was a result of sin. Therefore, he couldn't be in the camp because the Israelites in the camp were holy. They were consecrated because they were in the presence of God, especially in the tabernacle. All right. It is paramount that you understand the word judgment imperils the life or freedom of a person. But these theologians use the word metaphorically. Now, why did they do that? Because the judgments of white supremacy revolve around whether or not someone has the same skin color. If a black person randomly said, I'm moving out there where white folks stay at. Now, automatically, without ever visiting the neighborhood to see its quality of life, uh, the security, etc. Based off of what you have seen thus far, you know the person speaks of an affluent, prosperous neighborhood without ever visiting there. Well, that's judgment. <laughs> it is also the fruit of the sins of their forefathers who died decades ago. See, the Most High only judge based on fruits. Does he also judge the heart of a person? Yes. The person could have hate in their heart their entire life and never do harm to anyone and still be judged by the Most High. But another law of the Most High is to whom much is given, much is required. And the problem is when men get power, he judges off the desires of his heart. And to whom much is given, again, much is required. And Job 9.24 says the earth is given to the hands of the wicked. White supremacy is a packaged deal. You receive the greater judgment because you judge in all facets that uphold Egypt, which is Mizarim, the house of bondage, disguised as the matrix. But let's go back into scripture and see how Esau ascended to prominence. In part two, I read from Genesis chapter 25 and 27, briefly talking about the blessings given to Jacob and Esau, who sold his birthright for a morsel of food. But Esau was only able to be blessed primarily for two reasons. Number one, he had to live by the sword. Number two, the sons of Jacob, Israel, forsook their covenant with the Most High. Now, remember, again, to whom much is given, much is required. So, Deuteronomy chapter 7, 6, the Most High is speaking through his servant Moses to his chosen people. Okay, so Deuteronomy 7, 6, it says, For you are a people holy to your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Remember, he said to them, what will you give me for my gold, my silver and my gold? So the treasured possession of the Most High are the Semitic people, okay? The sons of Jacob, Israel, Judah, all right? There are many things physically, demographically, spiritually, and culturally that identifies God's chosen people. but. I won't get into that in this video because so-called white people like to hedge their bets. They like to skim off the top with God's word and use once saved, always saved and pre-tribulation rapture. A lot of these theologians like to skim off the top and hedge their bets by teaching this false doctrine, okay? Because they're fearful of the judgments that's coming upon their people, okay? But we must remember, scriptures say, the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. Going to Romans chapter 3, it says, verse 1, What advantage then has the jewel? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. What does this mean, to them the oracles of God were committed? Well, Let's go to Psalm 147, 19. It says, Psalm 147, 19, He, the Most High, declares his word to Jacob, 
his statutes, and his judgments to Israel. In verse 20, he has not dealt thus with any nation. And as for his judgments, they have not known them. Another question, how has God not dealt with any other nation as Jacob? Go back and read the prophecy of Genesis 25, 23, where it says one nation will be stronger than the other. Moses was a black man. How do you think he was able to stand in the presence of God, who is a consuming fire, if he didn't have melanin? One passage that many skim past is Revelation chapter 14, 1 through 5, which describes the 144,000 who have three key distinct characteristics. Number one, they are virgin sons. Number two, no deceit was found in their mouth. And number three, they are redeemed from the earth, from men, being the first fruits, the firstborn sons offered to God and the Lamb. So, whose sons were they? The Israelites. No other nation can say they offered 144,000 firstborn sons to the Most High. This, of course, in addition to Christ himself, a firstborn of all creation, an Israelite of Judah, who was sacrificed for the sins of all men. God will not accept the sacrifice of the heathen because they are not first fruits. They are recessive, and their father Esau sold his birthright for tangibles and measurements. All right? I hope you following me here. White supremacy is a packaged deal. You can't get your cake and eat it too. Okay, that's why Christ said you cannot serve God and mammon. What do you think he was talking about when he said that? All right? But again, part of the package deal was our disobedience. So let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 21. Okay, it says, they have provoked me to jealousy by what is not God. Okay, he's talking to the Jews. They have moved me to anger by their foolish idols. But I will provoke them to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move them to anger by a foolish nation. Pause. Please read this passage carefully and hear what God is saying. Okay, he parallels the frivolity of Israel moving him to anger with their idols to him provoking them to jealousy and anger by those who are a foolish nation. Two questions. How can Israel's offense against the Most High measure up to him provoking them to jealousy by a foolish nation? And number two, who is this foolish nation? Well, I will answer the second question more in depth by recommending you watch part one and two and also stick around for the remainder of this series to get more context to see who these people are presented in the text. But I've already told you, but haven't went too deep, that it's the European nations from the Caucasus Mountains. All right. That's short version. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 5 says, The Gentiles do not know God. Okay, this is folly to them. His ways are folly to them. This is an incredibly frivolous people. Okay, our people taught them about the ways of the Lord. And they repackaged the scriptures unto their likeness through their seminary schools. They painted an image of Caesar Borgia and told you he was Jesus Christ. Then they passed that lie down through their generations. So pride will make you do some foolish things. The first question, though, how does Israel's offense against God measure up to God's judgment against Israel? Because an offense against God should be more than an offense against man, right? Well, God himself. <laughs> Glory to God. Is Jesus Christ of the tribe of Judah. 
Okay, he was crucified by the Romans. This same foolish nation that's discussed in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 21. As I mentioned in part two, God makes sure that the heathen nations, that they see his face while he destroys their things in the book of Revelation. This is how we know the Gentiles, the merchants of the earth, mentioned in Revelation 18, who witnessed the smoke of her burning. Okay, the smoke of her burning is America. So these merchants of the earth, the Gentiles, they saw the same thing that John saw in Revelation chapter 1 when he fell on his face as a dead man because he saw the Most High staring at him, his eyes a flame of fire, and he had this huge afro. His hair was like wool, okay? A black man clothed in glory. That's why God said, how can you hate your brother you see and love God whom you don't see? <laughs> How were the Gentiles able to see God in Revelation 18? Well, in my opinion, that was the last thing they saw before they died. Because the scriptures say no man can see God at any time and live. So at that point, they're not in time, but they're in transition to the lake of fire. I tell you, man, these pastors, these false prophets have really, really done a number on many people. That's why they're going to get it so bad, too, because nobody's teaching this stuff in detail. Geno Jennings will never teach you this stuff. He says that when John, the revelator, saw God, that was a metaphor. He didn't literally see God. OK, then he starts giving all of these it's just metaphorically speaking, and this represents that. His hair represents this or that. He's not giving the scriptures exactly how it is read out. Now, John saw the Most High and fell on his face like a dead man. Okay? The scriptures also say that man will seek death and not find it. Okay? So at this point, at the end of the book, it doesn't matter if man sees God. Man's going to see God in the great white throne judgment. Okay, the fact that he's already transitioning from this flesh. These people, if they see God, they're going to die. So man, it's not that man cannot see God. It's that if they see him, he's going to die. So they're going to die anyway. All their riches have come to nothing in Revelation 18. And they're pretty much just cheap for the slaughter. All right. But I'll have to get more into this in the next part of this series. But let me know your thoughts in the comments and enjoy the rest of your day.